Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello again. I'm Town Councilman Frank Moriello, and welcome to another edition of Colony Close-Up. Today I'm here with Mike Rush, Director of the Building Department, and John Bush, our Code Enforcement Officer, to talk about code enforcement in the Town of Colony. And I'd like to do is start with Mike first. Mike, could you tell us um, wh what are the duties of a, a Code Enforcement Officer? Well, basically, Frank, the Code Enforcement Officer enforces two codes. One is the New York State Property Maintenance Code, which is a New York State law, uh, concerned with obviously property maintenance, you know, the upkeep of the property, both exterior and interior, and also our zoning law, which uh, concerns the use of your, uh, of your property uh, for zoning purposes. Okay. And um, John, I'd like to ask you, how are, are some of the complaints re received? They're usually uh, called in by telephone. Uh, some are received from the, uh, the Town and Colony Police Department, fire services, and uh, some from Albany County Department of Health. Now, can they also be uh, received online? Do you, uh, I imagine, emails to the building department as well? Uh, not very often. Every now and then we receive some online, but uh, not too often. So if a resident wanted to, though, they could take a photograph of, the, of that parcel, and they could, they could email the photograph with their complaint to the building department? They could. Okay. Right. We, have, we have received some of those, Frank. No, every every uh, department has a computer that if you send it to, like, building, uh, dot, uh, com or dot org, um, then it, it would come to my desk. And we do get some complaints by email, and sometimes we do get them with uh, photographs attached, which makes it easy for us so we know exactly what we're looking for when we go out to investigate. Okay. okay. I just thought that might be a, an easier way for you to, to receive them as well probably a little bit quicker uh, for you to respond also. Um, what type of, of complaints, John, do you usually receive? There's a lot that uh, deal with uh, overgrown property, high grass, um, junk vehicles. Uh, state code states you can only have one unregistered vehicle on the property um, and no junk vehicles. Like if the vehicle has a, uh, a flat tire or it's in a state of disrepair, you, it's not allowed. Um, and how about some of the, the property maintenance issues as far as uh, uh, the condition of the lawn or the landscaping? What are some of the regulations for that? Well, lawn uh, can't be over 10 inches in, in height, any grass or weeds. Um, landscaping, that's really a cosmetic uh, issue. The code doesn't touch that. But as far as the lawn is concerned, no longer lawn, than right, no 10 inches uh, right. in height? Okay. No and inches. how about the exterior condition of the home itself, if there's any debris, rubbish, garbage around the house? There can be any accumulation of rubbish, garbage, uh, dry branches, um, exterior of the, of the house itself has to be maintained, uh, no peeling paint, um, things of that nature. No broken windows, broken I would imagine. Windows. Okay, okay. Um, and are, do you receive complaints concerning fences or sheds or pools? We do. Uh, fences, sheds, pools, um, fences in a state of disrepair, falling down, not painted, um, pools without proper gates. The fence around the pool could be in a state of disrepair, and not to uh, not to code. Um, how about any type of uh, tenant landlord complaints? So do you, do you get those as well? We do. We do get uh, tenant landlord complaints. A lot of uh, uh, landlords not maintaining the property, um, providing uh, heat in the winter time, or uh, upkeeping upkeep the buildings themselves. So what are some of the more common uh, complaints that you receive? It depends on the season. Probably this, this time of year, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of high grass. In the wintertime, uh, you'll get more of the landlord tenant complaints about the heating systems or windows not working properly, leaking cold air, things of that nature. So um, when you receive a complaint, um, and you initially, I'm sure, investigate it, what's the, what's the process from there? Well, we take in the complaint, we go to the, to the site, investigate the complaint to make sure it is a valid complaint, and then we contact the property owner to uh, correct the violation. Okay, and um, 
if the property owner doesn't respond initially, what's the next step? The next step would be a, uh, a formal letter. And then if no response is given then, then would, it would go to an order to remedy and then an appearance ticket. Okay, could you explain, explain uh, I, I guess the letter that you would, you would send, uh, what you'd be requesting of, of the person, and then when it goes to an order of remedy, what's the process and what's expected of them at that point? And okay. And then what's the next step beyond that? Okay, the, uh, the letter would outline the, the complaint or the violation, uh, let them know what they needed to do to correct it. And, and give uh, us an, an example. Let's say uh, a person um, hasn't mowed their lawn in a month. Okay, so. we'd send them a letter uh, stating that uh, lawn in excess of 10 inches of, is a violation of New York State Property Maintenance Code and it needs to be corrected. And we'd give them a respond by date. If they didn't respond by that date, then we'd issue an OTR, which is an order to remedy. And that would uh, give them a specific date that they would have to correct the violation or an appearance ticket would be issued. Appearance ticket to uh, appear before the town uh, County, uh, our justice, justice court. court. Okay. Um, typically, how long would you give a person once you sent them a letter to uh, correct the problem? Well, it would depend on the violation. If it was a, a, a life safety issue, then it would be an immediate, it would need immediate attention. But something like high grass, we'd give them, you know, a week or 10 days. Okay. And then the order of remedy, usually about how long is that as well? About five days, or depending on the, on the issue. Okay. If it's, a, you know, life safety, certainly it would be a, need immediate attention. And then when they're issued the appearance court and they, and they go to our, our town justice court, um, are you there uh, for the hearing? I am. And are you, what do you bring with you to the hearing? I bring a copy of the, uh, of the report, the inspection report, and also any pictures or documents that, that go along with that uh, specific complaint. Okay. And what has been your experience, or maybe Mike, you can answer this, you've been going to justice court for a long time. What's your experience once you reach Justice Court? Um, what have you seen? Well, first of all, Frank, the limits of the uh, authority that a judge has in our Justice Court is he can do one of two things, is either fine you or uh, he can jail you. Uh, typically, a judge will not jail you for, for this type of an offense. Um, but he can only do that after you, one of two things have to happen. One is you plead guilty to the charges or you're found guilty uh, uh, after a trial. Uh, we don't have too many trials, normally the, uh, we settle it before that. We do get some guilty pleas, uh, and then the judge normally uh, levies a fine at that point, uh, which doesn't correct the violation, but hopefully it, uh, uh, it won't happen uh, a second time. Okay, could you tell us what some of the more common violations are that, that you see in the town? Uh, well, it depends on whether we're talking property maintenance or zoning, zoning law violations. Well, I haven't gotten into zoning yet, so we'll do property maintenance. So if we want to stick to property maintenance code, um, like John had mentioned, at this time of year, we do get a lot of uh, complaints about neighbors who don't cut their lawn. Uh, the, the property maintenance code of New York State does limit the height of weeds and grass to 10 inches. So it takes probably about a month for that to occur. Uh, early spring, late fall, like or early fall, like we are now, 10 inches uh, is not uncommon for someone who just doesn't keep their property up. Uh, another violation that we get is a person, and it's sometimes on the same property that the high grass occurs. You also get your your uh, maintenance of of the building itself, the dwelling itself. Uh, the uh, the paint starts peeling. Um, on older houses, uh, they could contain lead, so this becomes a health hazard. Sometimes, as John had mentioned before, uh, we do get Albany County Health uh, involved, something like that. Uh, if it, the house gets in really bad shape and it's vacant, sometimes we have a rodent infestation uh, that we will get uh, Albany County Health involved again. Uh, and there's quite a few complaints of that nature that we receive. Um, Zoning, zoning we do, but we can hit that in, uh, in a little bit. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, is uh, as I'm thinking of it now, we probably should give the uh, phone number for the building department, so if anyone has any, any uh, for our complaints, they, could, they can contact you. What is that number? Well, um, it is in the phone book, so uh, they can contact us, 783-2706. Uh, 
Uh, they can also contact us by email, which is uh, building uh, at colony.org. Um, and like I said before, that comes directly to my desk. And uh, I normally print out the, uh, the email we get and I put it on John's desk and have him go investigate. Um, if they have uh, a fax machine, they can fax us. Uh, and our fax number is 783-2772. Um, sometimes we receive complaints to the supervisor's office where the super they're called a supervisor because they are familiar with the town supervisor, Mary Brazell, and, and she sends them over to us uh, for investigation. Do you track the number of uh, complaints that you receive yearly? We do. We give each uh, new one a number. Uh, we receive approximately 340, 350 complaints a year, uh, which equates to about one and a half per day that we receive. I don't know how we're doing this year, John, whether we're we're in the uh, behind or ahead or we're about right on track we're in the high okay. 200s at this point okay so that's about how many we'll get this year again and how many of those do you think will be resolved and about how long do you think it'll take on average to resolve an issue well like John had mentioned depends on the issue normally high grass gets resolved fairly quickly, fairly quickly. Um, probably about John maybe you could correct me but 90 percent are corrected after John does his investigation and either calls the person, leaves a tag, they call us and to find out what the tag is about, 90% are corrected right then. The yeah, person really doesn't know that they're in violation of the law. Seven, eight percent after that um, takes an order to remedy to uh, correct them, sometimes a, a letter from John. And uh, the, the rare occasion where a person just doesn't, you know, uh, correct a violation with a letter, a phone call. Uh, they end up talking to one of our town justices. Okay. I would, I would say at any given time, there's usually about 100 uh, active complaints that, that you're that working are, on. That are active, that I'm, okay. that I'm working on. Okay. Let's go into some of the zoning law violations. Um, explain uh, uh, some of those. Okay. Uh, a big one for that is running a business out of a home. A lot of uh, landscaper contractor type uh, uh, businesses uh, we get complaints regarding those um, that's not allowed out of a, uh, a residential area uh, they're allowed to have their own personal vehicle that they drive back and forth but they uh, they can't store their business equipment on the property and that generates a lot of complaints now people are allowed to to operate a business in their home but uh, what are the restrictions they uh, can't impact the uh, the neighborhood. They cannot have any outside employees and they can't take up over 25% uh, of the interior of the uh, of the home itself. Are they allowed signage? No signage. No signage at all. Okay. Um, what are some of the other uh, zoning complaints that, that you have? We get the uh, complaints on continuous garage sales. Um, they're only allowed to have three garage sales in a year and they uh, they have to be uh, get uh, run by the person who resides at the property, and they have to sell only their own goods. So um, you do have actually have residents calling and complaining that they have a neighbor that's that's running, running a continuous garage sale, or has items, uh, you know, one after the other, you know, item or two out there out in their yard for sale. Um, we also get complaints about uh, cars being sold from property. Um, one or two every now and then is okay, but any more than that, it's looked upon as running a used car uh, business, and uh, that's a violation as well. Okay, Mike, I know you have more experience with uh, with zoning. What are some of the other issues that you see concerning uh, uh, zoning and, and uh, our code enforcement? Well, like John has mentioned, you know, the running of the business, whether it's a landscaping business or any other business. Um, is a violation and sometimes people who run uh, a business out of the home think that we have to catch them doing it well I don't think they realize that a lot of their neighbors are our watchdogs and uh, and we get calls all the time I mean like I say one, one and a half per day so we get calls from neighbors all the time uh, some are valid complaints some aren't a lot of them come in um, because the two neighbors aren't getting along and they'll call us with something that may have occurred a few years ago. And uh, like putting a shed up without a permit. 
Um, or they've done renovation work without permits, or they finished off their basement without permits. And these are difficult for us to catch, like the interior renovation ones, but normally the neighbors know what's going on in the neighborhood. And it just takes one thing from a neighbor to irritate the other one, and next thing you know, we get a call that the, uh, the, the basement was finished off, and we'll go, and I'll send John out to investigate, and He'll knock on the door, and if no one's there, I'll leave a tag. But eventually, we'll get in the house and take a look at it. And and these are violations. So I mean, the correct the, the corrective action for that one is they have to come in and get a permit uh, for the work that was done. It has to comply with the code as if it was being built today. And sometimes this is an issue. Um, but uh, now that's an important subject because <coughs> there's there are a number of people that will make um, enhancements to their home to the interior of their home. And I don't even think they know that they have to get uh, a permit to, to do so. So explain that yeah. a little bit more in detail. Um, when do you need a permit when you're doing an, an, any type of interior remodeling? Um, and uh, how do you obtain one? Well, sometimes it's easier to explain when you don't need a permit uh, for interior renovation. And that would include, let's say, if you're replacing your carpet or you're doing painting or if you're replacing windows with the same size a window that went out permits are not required for that. When you replace your shingle roof, there's no permit required for that. But if you're starting to reconfigure the space inside your home, or if you're, re, let's say, removing structural walls for some reason or other, making a room bigger and you need a structural beam to su support the rafters, all of these things require permits. And they require drawings to show the building department what work uh, is being done. The, um, the procedure is that they have to come in and fill out a building permit application. The form is online. They can get it online. Uh, they need to give us, uh, along with the application, two sets of plans. Um, there are certain requirements for certain work uh, that would require a, an architect's stamp on the drawings, like if it's a, a structural alteration where they're actually taking out a bearing wall and putting a beam in to support the rafters. That does require a permit, or a, uh, I'm sorry, it does require an architect's seal on the drawings. Uh, if the cost of the work is over $20,000, also requires an architect's or an engineer's seal on the drawings. Um, we would review those drawings to see if it complies with the code. And uh, if it does, then we would uh, issue the, the permit. Uh, there's a fee involved, normally based on cost. And then during the course of the construction, we would be doing inspections and at the end uh, of the work uh, if everything complies with the drawings uh, we would issue a certificate of occupancy now what happens in the case of a violation where work was done without permits sometimes it's difficult for us to see the work as it's progressing obviously so in a rare instance we would have the homeowner remove portion of the work so we can view what was done like we have to look at the insulation to see if it complies with the energy code. So they may have to remove some of the, uh, the sheetrock that they did so we can see what the insulation that they used. So sometimes it gets more expensive afterwards to get a permit than it would was if they did it in the first place. No, that's important to know because if, if someone is thinking about finishing their basement, um, I imagine quite often a number of people do it themselves and on their own spare time and they would never even consider or think about having to get a, a permit. and and uh, worry about having it inspected. Well, one of, the, one of the big issues with finishing off a basement is that the residential code of New York State requires that if you put habitable space in basements, and habitable, sp habitable space means living, eating, cooking, or sleeping spaces, which if you're finishing off your basement, you probably have some living space down there that you've added, it does require emergency egress from the basement. The stairs to your first floor do, does not count as emergency egress. So you would have to normally knock a hole in your basement wall and of a sufficient size for egress to a window well or something like that. That gets very expensive, especially if you've already finished off the wall and it's all sheet rocked and insulated and things like that. Um, so any habitable space in basements needs em need emergency egress. Also every sleeping area in your basement. So if you've made two bedrooms in your basement, you need two emergency egress openings, and uh, that's what the code requires. So, it could be expensive if you know you didn't know this up front. 
No, I, can, I, I understand that. It could be very expensive. Very expensive. That's interesting. I never knew that, and I'm sure there are a number of residents that, that weren't aware of that as well. What if you have a situation where someone had uh, uh, put a shed in their backyard, never, never got the permit, and, and three years later uh, you received a complaint uh, at that point? What do you do? Well, we've gone back even further than three years. Uh, I'm not sure if we've ever gone back more than maybe 10 or 15, but uh, if someone calls us up and says that a shed was placed without a permit, we would go and investigate. We would look at our records to see if indeed uh, it was done without a permit. And sometimes we get calls from a neighbor who says that they did not have a permit, and we found out that they did. Uh, but if they didn't, then they would have to show us a site plan also to show exactly where the shed was uh, located to make sure that it complies with our zoning laws, that it has the correct setbacks from the side yard and side property line and rear property line, and that it's constructed according to code. And uh, if so, we would issue a, uh, a permit at that time. They'd have to pay for it. There's a small fee involved for a shed. But since uh, sheds and, and fences are in pools are, are very popular, what are some of the requirements? What are, what's the code for, uh, for fences, for sheds, and for pools in the town? Well, we do not regulate fences in the town, as some municipalities do. Um, so if someone calls us up and said, you know, I, I want to put a fence up, what are the regulations? We normally tell them we do not regulate fencing. However, we advise that they should know where their property line is to ensure that the fence is on their property and not their neighbors. We get calls sometimes that someone put up a fence with what they call the good side facing in. And they say, isn't that a violation? And I say, I'm sorry, but we don't regulate fencing. If, if someone wanted to put the good side facing in, which normally is not done, but sometimes it is, uh, and sometimes we get calls on that. The only time we regulate fencing is if it surrounds a swimming pool and it's required uh, to, uh, uh, to be a barrier for a swimming pool so that children can't come in the yard and then fall in a pool. Normally it's an, it's an in-ground pool, but some above-ground pools too don't have the required uh, barrier so that they would require a, a fence around those also. And that's a four-foot high fence um, around either the pool or the yard and it gets a little tricky if the, the dwelling itself is part of the barrier around the pool so that if you have a child living in the house that they can't go out the door undetected. So there's an alarm that's required at the, at the door. Um, and there's now an, a new uh, state uh, code uh, just went into effect just recently that also requires a pool alarm that detects any movement of the water in the pool. And, uh, this is also required now, so that any new pool go, goes in needs one of these uh, pool alarms to detect movement of the water. So in case a small child fell in, there's an alarm that goes off uh, in the vicinity of the pool, normally around the house, so that you could hear it quite loud, so that you know that some, something fell in the pool. Could be an animal, could be a child. Sometimes on a strong, windy day, I understand, the pool alarm will go off. Now, is this so. just for in-ground pools? Or is it for above ground as well? It's, a f it's for all pools, not only residential, but commercial pools also. Above and Above ground, ground and in ground. ground. Okay. And it's also required for uh, spas also. Um, the only exception is if the spa has, uh, is equipped with a safety cover, then the uh, pool alarm is not required. Okay. No, that's interesting. I think that's important for our residents to know. And as far as sheds are concerned, um, I know they have to be set back, I believe, five feet from the property line. Is that correct? If it's in the rear yard, which means that the, the shed is wholly beyond the rear line of the house, the requirement is that it needs to be five feet from the side yard and five feet from the rear property line. If it's on the side of the house, so it's not totally in the rear yard, then it needs to require, it needs to comply with side yard setbacks, which depending on how old your lot is, whether it's a grandfather lot or a new lot, uh, the setbacks vary. Okay. I know sometimes we've also received uh, complaints concerning overcrowding uh, in a home. Can uh, either John or Mike explain uh, any, any calls that you've received and, and you know, what the regulations are? Well, I've received uh, calls regarding overcrowding, um, but it's uh, generally um, a neighbor will call up said there's you know, more than uh, the amount of people that 
Let me see if I can. Uh, let's yeah. see if I can, if I can do that because because that's really a tricky one. It is. And and I know John is 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 getting into the into the overcrowding uh, law, um, and it has to do obviously. Well, I shouldn't say it obviously, but some people think that if they're not living as a family, let's say that they're college students living in a house, and there's too many of them, and, and normally it's because they're noisy. Um, there is no law that says how many people can live in a dwelling unit, and it, there is no law that says they have to be related. Um, and if they're not related, they can't live like, like a family. Well, there is no law like that. If they're living as a family, which means that they are occupying the dwelling. They're eating together. They're sleeping together. They go out to work in the morning. They go to school in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, whatever it is. They're living as a family. And there is no number limit as to how many it can be in the house. Having said all that, when you get into the Property Maintenance Code of New York State, there is a requirement in there to say that if, um, let's say, and, they, and it's based on the square footage of the bedrooms, dining room, living room, that there can only be so many people if you only have so much room in, uh, say, bedroom space. And the requirement is, is that for every person you need 50 square feet of bedroom space. So if you only have two bedrooms and they're 100 square feet apiece, then you can only have four people living in that dwelling unit. Um, and it's also, and I'm not exactly sure of the requirement for living room, di uh, dining room, but uh, I believe it's like 70 square feet for a dining room and 150 square feet for a living room. So if your rooms are smaller than that, you may be limited to the number of people you can have living in the house. But it's by square footage of bedrooms and living room, dining room, and not by, you know, how many people your neighbor thinks should be occupying the house. Okay, and I, I imagine if anyone has any questions about that, they can just give you a call and, and you'll, you'll investigate it. Absolutely. Now, what are some of the complaints that you receive from the Albany County Health Department? We receive complaints regarding uh, sanitation, regarding the interior of the property. Um, if uh, they come in and they feel that the, the property is uns you know, unsanitary, uh, accumulation of garbage or debris inside, infestation of uh, rodents, mice, things of that nature they'll call us up um, if the plumbing isn't working correctly it's all a, a violation of the property maintenance code and we'll have to go in and, and in investigate that now if you do find a violation and and the owner is just not capable it doesn't have the means to to correct the problem at what point uh, or at that point what do you do well the county does uh, provide services and they do help help out to a certain extent regarding that okay and um, I imagine those uh, those must be a little bit more difficult they to, are. to to deal with because you you know that's a person's home. It is a person's home, and it's it is more difficult to. Uh, now, to um, do I do they uh, do you ask for access to the home? We or do. Uh, if they if they they don't have to grant you the access if if they don't want to. That's correct. That's correct. Um, a lot of times we'll go in uh, along with Albany County. We'll coordinate the uh, the inspection, so we go together. And uh, usually nine times out of ten, they'll, they'll grant us access and we'll go in. Okay, because I know often uh, I've received phone calls uh, about too many pets, especially cats, mm -hmm. in a house. And, and is that something that you would investigate as well? Well, uh, the uh, animal control would, would handle that one. And sometimes we'll go in conjunction with them to see if there's any other violations that exist uh, regarding the interior of the property as far as uh, uh, structure or... Uh, sanitation okay uh, okay that's good that's I mean that's important for residents to know that they uh, if they have if this is an issue actually who to call um, and it's Mike can you add anything to to anything else uh, anything concerning the uh, the health department any other issues or concerns that they may contact you about well I mean we do get uh, a lot of calls from Albany County Health and we also call Albany County Health a lot to come with us uh, on certain issues uh, an overcrowding of animals is one of them. The, you know, there is no uh, maximum number of animals that, that a, uh, a person can have in their dwelling unit. If you remember, Frank, a few years ago, we even uh, proposed something. That, and, I, and I'm not sure if it came from us. Maybe it came from a resident that thought there should be a law to ha as to how many. 
and I think the town board decided that we're not going that far in regulating a person's home as to how many pets they can have. It became a little cumbersome and I think maybe a little too restrictive and the town board just didn't want to go there. Um, but, um, uh, you know, John has been on the job probably two years, two I think years. now, John, and uh, there's a lot of different laws that John has to enforce. And a lot of them get a little bit tricky. And like you say, Frank, when you're dealing with someone's home, it's really an issue. Um, we used to have a, a code enforcement officer that would be surprised. He'd come back to the office and was surprised that when he went up to talk to someone, they were irritated before he even rang the doorbell. And I, and I used to tell him, I said, they were irritated as soon as you got out of your car because they knew who you were and why you were there. And a person doesn't like to be intruded upon when he's in his home. So um, John has a very difficult job. Um, he is tasked with enforcing uh, property maintenance and zoning laws. And, an, and John is only doing residential complaints. We have another commercial department that does commercial complaints. But they're normally about a commercial property, and it's not someone's home. So John has a very difficult job. John's learning very well. He <laughs> does an excellent job. And um, sometimes uh, I get complaints after John leaves the property that, you know, your code enforcement w w officer was over here. But John handles himself very well with the, uh, the residents of the town of Colony uh, on a very difficult uh, issue. Okay. And as we wrap up, I just want you once again to, uh, to give the phone number and, uh, and your email address. So if, if anyone has any complaints, they'd like to contact Mike or John. Uh, you can be contacted at. Okay, We're, our phone number is 783-2706. Uh, if you call that, please ask for John. Uh, <laughs> our email is uh, building at colony.org and if someone emails uh, to uh, the building, it will come to my computer and then I will take care of it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Gentlemen, I appreciate your time today and, and I hope this is informative. And again, if anyone has any, any questions, please uh, contact the building department at, at any time. Thank you, and, and have a good day.